So we'll have about half an hour for your presentations, Joe. Sure. And then um, about 15 minutes for questions. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on a rainy well, right at night. Uh, for those, um, thank you uh, to Serge, first of all, uh, uh, Transfer Inquiry Research Group, and of course, Dr. Matthew Abbott, and um, soon to be Dr. Ben Namquam. Oh, so, and uh, I would also like to um, pay my respect to the Wagaron people on whose land this university is placed. Um, this analysis is uh, comes from last year where I went to Taiwan to live for a year to write an independent, um, an independent uh, research on the Taiwan-China situation or the China-Taiwan China situation. Um, and I wrote a report for them which turned out to be 35,000 words instead of, I really wanted it to be 25,000 but uh, it, it blew out a little bit because the, the issue is so, so challenging. Uh, and the issue is so challenging and I lived in Taiwan in 2001 and 2002 as well and I found the problem back then troublesome and when I went back last year, I found it frightening. So that'll give you an idea of uh, what hit me in the head, essentially. Um, so I'll go through this. I'll, I'll set the pace by doing a little bit of history, then a few concepts and understandings, and then I'll move into the actual Taiwan-China situation. So that's the semi-structure of this little talk. Uh, I haven't included a cited, uh, I haven't included a cited slide but everything in the talk is evidence-based. And I will send Ben a link for anybody who's interested in um, having a read and also uh, having a read and also um, interested in the subject more. So, and if you want the report, if you want to read the report, it's called Asia Pacific and Prostate Machinations Challenges for Taiwan and the Nascent Phase of Park Sino. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that obviously. Um, I like to say that if you're into international, if you're into international relations or you've got insomnia, that report is for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll um, we'll move on real quick. We'll get through a few of these slides. This is where Taiwan is, as you can see, very close to mainland China, uh, not far away at all. Uh, some of the islands over here belong to Taiwan, and on a clear day, you can see China. So that's where it's east of uh, Taiwan. So. How did it get to this? The, the bit of history we're interested in is uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists lost the mainland war to, Mayo, uh, to Mayo's communist long march forces in about circa, completely in circa 949, but there was a migration to Taiwan prior to that, from about 1946 onwards. Um, so they retreated en masse to the nearest islands, Formosa, uh, which is a Portuguese word for beautiful island, and now it's called Taiwan with the intent of regrouping and relaunching an attack on Chinese uh, mainland Maoist forces. Um, as a result, Chiang Kai-shek summarily declared sovereign independence, uh, which was removed by the UN in October 1971. So, uh, there was a war on the mainland, Chiang Kai-shek lost. Uh, the reason that China didn't come over to Taiwan was because the Americans supported the Taiwanese, the foremost in government at the time, uh, and of course, Mayo's China is vastly different in terms of capabilities than modern day China, but we'll be in terms of. All right, I just want to set the scene a little bit about sovereignty. Um, so, China is a sovereign, therefore legal nation state, versus Taiwan is an independent country. So, there's a subtle and overt difference in these two things. Uh, Non-endorsement by the UN, non-representation in the UN means sovereign denial. Uh, Taiwan, Taiwan, however, however uh, is perplexing in the sense that it has a government, it has soft power, which I'll talk about in a little while, influence, an international presence of sorts by cultural trade offices in many countries. It has its own currency. Um, it has major manufacturing industry. Uh, it's got trade balances, it's got, all, it's got all of the aspects of a sovereign nation state, but it's not a sovereign nation state. Um, to put it 
to make sure that understanding sovereignty and what it is, is the world consists of and is divided into sovereign territorial states that recognise no superior authority. The processes of lawmaking, settlements of dispute and law enforcement are largely in the hands of individual states and international law is oriented to the establishment of min minimal values and rules of coexistence. So the sovereign state is obviously a, a um, entity on its own and this is the only way uh, the UN will support you if you have that. So Taiwan is fundamentally not supported by the UN. Okay, so it's important also tonight for the purpose of this talk when it all changed essentially for the world and for Taiwan. Deng Xiaoping era from 1978 to 1992 where there was positive, cathartic and iconoclastic change. Um, one country, two systems kicked in. Mayo's policy of protracted class struggle ended and the four modernisations which uh, are defence, agriculture, industry, science and technology which was a significant shift from the mayor of self-imposed isolation, inward-looking, and non-cosmopolitan positivism, which means, essentially, that you don't look outside of yourself and you believe in your own history and there's no influence from anybody else, to a reinvigorated nationalism, expansive cosmopolitanism, one would probably call that globalisation, and preponderance-based projection through military, economic, and diplomatic presence. So... That's what China, that's what happened to China, and fun, it fundamentally, um, it fundamentally uh, is proof that this continues to this day, even though, of course, Deng Xiaoping is dead, um, and his uh, foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, they really pushed hard for China to change. So, prior to 1995, China was not a danger to Taiwan, per se. And then all of these sorts of things started to kick in and everything changed for Taiwan and essentially for the world. I can't see the bottom one, that's right, we'll get there. Um, so there's a, a few relevant concepts and understandings that are important to Australia but also vitally important to um, understanding China's role in the world and particularly, obviously, towards Taiwan. Irredentism, I'll talk about that in a sec. So we'll just go to Industrial Revolution. And Industrial Revolution um, is essentially what happens to countries that mechanise, industrialise, and then expand beyond their borders due to their Industrial Revolution. Um, it's obviously happening to China, it happened to Western Europe, it happened to Britain. Britain ruled the world through its Industrial Revolution. And... Uh, as a result of that, essentially ruled the world. But it was an industrial revolution. Think of the Spanish conquering the South Americas. That was due to the fact that science and technology expanded. They built ships and off they went. It happened, same thing happened to the French, industrial revolution. Um, and essentially, um, Britain, for instance, their industrial revolution started in circa 1700, circa 1750, to the end of World War I, perhaps World War II. Um, what, it what industrial revolutions take with them is mercantilism. And the reason the British were so, were so powerful was because they traded in the pound sterling around the world. This happened with America, with the Bretton Woods Agreement after World War II. It was due to an industrial revolution promoting and developing mercantilism. And then, of course, you get nationalism. Uh, nationalism is essentially being part of a national grouping that is defined in civic terms, shares, a participation in a circumscribed political community, common political values, a sense of belonging and all those types of things, and usually a common language. And the bottom area here, I don't know why it's not showing, it's soft power, there's three types of power, soft power, hard power, and sharp power. These are the types of power that we're interested in in international relations. Soft power is usually through things like education or aid or funding of infrastructure, such as Things like scholarships for education, so you might give scholarships to a country that's less privileged than your one. It doesn't matter which, east, west, it doesn't matter. But um, that's soft power. Hard power is more military and economic, or the possibility of military and economic power um, intruding on um, another country. And sharp power is a very new, uh, a new 
understanding of what power is. Um, sharp power is a form of information warfare. It's part of the globalisation um, cyber culture, um, which per penetrates and perforates the political and information environments in target countries. Personally, I think that's too narrow a definition of power, sharp power, but it'll do for the process of this talk. But certainly uh, the rise of the digital media, uh, digital information, and of course those types of things is what China is indulging in, and Australia has been the victim of, according to the popular press, and also obviously Taiwan is completely um, alert and aware to this factor. All right, so they're the types of power. But the most important one for the purpose of this talk is irredentism. So what happens with irredentism is um, irredentist policies come to the political foreground and drive new ideas. So what is irredentism? Um, the, the idea of ir irredentism is that there is an overarching any country advocating the acquisition of some region included in another country by reason of cultural, historical, ethical, racial or other ties. Now, you could bear in mind that it's nothing to do with facts. It's just what we believe. It's, it's what a country believes. So we can, we can shift the focus from China and Taiwan to understand what irredentism actually is. So it um, includes the direction of, you know, China moving obviously on Taiwan because of its irredentist policies and its irredentism. And it's a nation state that can expand with these irredentist policies intact. But let's talk about irredentism. So the Britain ownership of India, Australia, Scotland, Wales and Gibraltar is irredentism. They believe they owned it, so they just went and got them. For lots of other historical reasons, but the irredentist policies were wherever Britain goes, essentially if they've discovered it first, they own it. So, the other factors are the US steel in Hawaii from a Hawaiian princess claiming Diego Sia Americans and American Samoa. So think of the French in Oceania and Southeast Asia into China uh, in particular. Um, these are examples of irredentist policies which are essentially viewed through the prism of power which is followed by policies that enforce and then reinforce the reality of those thoughts. Uh, just to balance things out, Russia and the Ukraine, Israel and the West Bank, in the West Bank, Japan and Okinawa, is to observe that it's not only the West that indulges in, in irredentism as a construct and as a happening. The, the point being that historical facts are manipulated and ultimately, ultimately usurped by irredentism and the corresponding attitudes it produces. So we're not here to make an argument about whether Japan owns Okinawa. It's just to to push the point that irredentist policies are often backed up by a threat of force for all force. Um, so that's, these things are the uh, reconfiguration of history, what is it that we once owned, we should own again, the regeneration of nationalism. So once a country gets powerful, nationalism rises, um, and this usually re reinvigorates a certain idealism where the country that owns it, we're the perfect power, the Han Chinese believe they're pure, the Japanese believe they're pure uh, historically. So then they, they reinvigorate uh, policies, cultural and political, and they also invest in what's called strategic realignment, which is that actual area that that country in is actually ours. So this then moves us to the next, uh, the next factor is these are tangible outcomes that obviously China has towards Taiwan, Pre-1995, it wasn't able to indulge in these types of things, but it's not the only country that's doing it in the world. Russia's doing it, as I said, in the Ukraine, for instance. Um, but these are the three components that a country that is powerful and focused indulges in. So, what is geostrategic uh, aggrandizement? It's, a, it's the power of... Um, and, the, and the display of power through bases, ports, and the associate, uh, and associate ten, attempts of power. Uh, it's usually associated with a strong and overt presence, particularly of a navy and an air force, and often will have a boots on the ground present as well. The US and China both have currently got bases in Somalia. 
Um, the US has a massive air base in Saudi Arabia and a naval base in the United Arab Emirates. All assets are utilised beyond the borders of their own domestic environment, that is, the own US domestic environment. And that's strategic, geostrategic aggrandizement. Um, so, you can also think of Britain and its presence as far away as the Falkland Islands, which is in the South Atlantic, and Islas Malvinas, and numerous countries in Antarctica. They're all, that's, that's all geostrategic aggrandizement. So, then we can move on to um, understanding uh, a security dilemma. So, what you can do with a security dilemma is you can promote your own country as a protector of another or as a protector of an area. A security dilemma um, essentially means that a country or an actor, in international relations they're called actors, engages via multiple means in regions of the world not strategically important to their domestic security which essentially means you're able to meddle in the affairs of others. Um, and to offset, in, it's also used to offset intrusions by other actors. So you can create security dilemmas to improve your position in the international sphere. Um, Australia in the Vietnam War is a good example of creating a security dilemma because if we didn't go to war in Vietnam, then the hordes, the communist hordes would have come down through the Philippines and Indonesia into Northern Australia. That's the, that's the stopping, the creating the security dilemma in order to stop something. Um, and being able to undertake that, having the power and the forces to undertake that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then there's this one, which is possibly the most important one out of these three. So brinkmanship. What is that? Um, brinkmanship is defined as a when decision makers perceive a dramatic impending shift in the balance of power in favour of their adversary or in the face of a substantial challenge at home. Margaret Thatcher is a classic example of this. She was losing, she was supposed to lose the election and the Falklands War was create, essentially created, she rose to power. So it was brinkmanship that did it. She was able, she had the facilities and the assets, Britain had the facilities and the asset to impose brinkmanship. Um, there was also, there's also other elements of brinkmanship, such as what's called the Cod Wars in, um, of between Iceland and Britain, 1973 and 1975, in which there was a dispute over fishing rights and Navy ships were ramming each other. So it doesn't actually have to engage in war, but brinkmanship means you've got the facilities and the assets to push your country's purpose and create a dilemma, a security dilemma and, and bring it you. Okay, um, so, what have we got here? Um, but this can lead to a shooting war, which in international relations is called the kinetic exchange. So that's the technical term. So you win your trivial pursuit night, I want 10% of the money player. <laughs> Because when they say, what's a war, what's a shooting war, the answer is, it's actually not a shooting war, it's a kinetic exchange. But, <laughs> um, we, but the point being, this is, this is a problem for Taiwan. So when is a war a war? When the United Nations Security Council Permanent Five vote and grant its legal status. So why is, why is the Syrian conflict not a war? Because Russia vetoes every single time it's mentioned as a war because they have the power of veto. So, hence the Vietnam War, or the American War as the Vietnamese call it, was never a legal war and therefore remained a conflict due to the power of veto, the UNSC P5, Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, the winners of the Second World War essentially, um, destroyed any chance of it ever being a war. So. That means that the UN then can't re pass resolutions to stop the war because it's not a war. Mm. So if China moves on Taiwan, gee, I wonder who's going to veto <laughs> the war. There's no war. Mm. So it's really a, a profound um, issue for Taiwan, is, um, and it will be a profound issue for Australia if the war starts. Okay, so let's let's move beyond that understanding and just go. Okay. So, what's China's attitude in contemporary time? Um, Hong Kong and Macau, both have been retroceded to China, given back to China.
Taiwan is a renegade province of China. Note, not a renegade state, because that would give it status. That would give it some level of equality. The Chinese Communist Party has persistently stated it will not rule, out, rule, out, rule, rule out the use of force should Taiwan remain steadfast in its political intent and independence progress. Okay, so China, since circa 1995, um, the attitude has become more sclerotic, hardened, hardened and focused. So, wh what's going to happen? Oh, I'll show you the crystal ball. I'm allowed to have a crystal ball on evidence-based argument. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Will there be a conflict? When will it happen? What is the evidence base? Key understandings are there's never been an industrial revolution without significant clashes. Um, threat of force movement to direct force is much more, much more easily transferred. So, because, part of that is because not just an industrial revolution, but this also shows a high level of diplomatic action and interaction. And so you can get allies quicker and easier and they'll move with you. Um, it's dependent, there is also a dependence on other criteria, which China is also having some problems with. Okay, uh, domestic harmony is necessary because then you don't need your army at home. This is why America, um, this is why America is able to go to other countries and Britain is able to go to other countries and France and have to intervene because there's a relatively high level of domestic harmony. You don't need your troops at home. Um, you need domestic food, energy security and political and, and military footprints so you can go from one area to the other. Um, further to that, the capabilities of actors is that when you go to war, defeat is unintended. So whether you're defending or in the offence, you actually go to war to win. That's why people go to war, even if they're defending against another country. So this is what China's frightened of Taiwan about. They've got <coughs> high defending capabilities. We'll talk about that in a minute. The other, the other factor is um, allies, enemies, and neutral actors, whereas Australia placed in this middle of the world. We'll get that in a sec. So um, let's go to a forecast of when, okay? When is it going to happen? Uh, I don't believe it's going to happen between 2020 and 2030, even though it's called in uh, international relations a dangerous decade. This is too soon. The um, Belt and Road Initiative, China's Belt and Road Initiative, East China Sea fortifications not completely established. The String of Pearls, which is military bases, um, naval bases throughout East Asia and Southeast Asia and on the top of Africa, have not been formulated, developed. Um, and also economically, they're not. They're not tight enough yet economically. Um, China-Russia relations are often strained, so there's a threat. If Russia wants to bother China, all it has to do is ship arms to the Uyghur population on the Russian border, and then you'll have a civil war on your hands between China and the Uyghurs. China-India relations are terrible. They're always terrible. They hate each other. Um, and China's allies are not certain. When you talk about allies, it's important to keep in mind that even a neutral actor is a quasi-ally because they won't move against you. If they say they're neutral, they won't move against you. Um, also, American isolationism hasn't really developed yet enough for China to feel that it's okay to move in the move against Taiwan or move in the uh, the uh, um, the Sea of Japan and, and the area around East Asia. So um, they have to wait till that comes to fruition. And whether America's pivot to Asia is all is just rhetoric or whether it's it will definitely come to Taiwan's aid. So these are just um, part of the forecast. So, okay, we'll move on. Okay, let's get to the point. <laughs> uh, 2049 Beckett. So 2049 is the 100th anniversary of China. So what happens is this is a critical point. Um, it, China must be reunified by this time, uh, according to Xi Jinping, according to China in general. They've got two, they must have the third place. Taiwan's the third. Um, Taiwan is a liberal democracy, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. The reason that Taiwan's a liberal well, the liberal democracy, because obviously it's adopted the liberal democracy model of the West, but also it's a disadvantage because 
they might vote in a power that will go, will, will, will defend until they die. Or they might vote in a more liberal attitude, a party that's got a more liberal attitude to China. So this is always a political nightmare in Taiwan because it can change in four years' time because they follow the American model of voting. Um, Cape, Taiwan has a capable and robust military able to defend itself. But what does defend mean? Often defend means destroying the enemy that's come to get you so badly that it affects the government at home. This is why Putin didn't go hard on Ukraine because the Ukraine can actually defend itself. And if you get too many body bags coming home, as in Afghanistan for the Russians, you get discontent in the population, even in communist countries. And that's multiplied in the democracies. Okay, the other reason is that Taiwan still retains a strong economic and political presence in many areas, and China is, China is fully aware of this, which means it has to focus on intent beyond the rhetoric of irredentism. Go back to irredentism. So, okay, can we go to this? Okay, 2035, this is what I forecast. Why? Because economic stability, the string of pearls, Built and Road Initiative has been exponentially developed as far as Oceania and Micronesia. The People's Liberation Army, Navy and Air Force will be more developed, disciplined and organised and capable. The US politico and military focus will be more understood and the disallowance of 2036 elections. You can't have this going on and on and on for the Chinese. And 13 years until reunification, that is not long in international relations. Okay. Conclusion. Let's just talk very quickly about war. There's already a war taking place. It's a war of rivalry, similar to the one that I talked about between Iceland and Britain in the 1970s. Um, they're already at, in war, but they're not in shooting war. There's just a rivalry. Okay. Total war is an escalation of the conflict to the point of unconditional surrender. Many actors are engaged in this beyond the Asia Pacific. We don't need to go into that too much, but um, a total war and um, the engagement with regards to unconditional surrender is the Germans in the Second World War, the Nazi, Nazi Germans, they, everything had gone too far for an agreement to be reached. Japan and America, Hiroshima, all of that, that means everything's gone beyond anything except unconditional surrender. Um, limited war is a subjective terminology associated with war. Um, my argument in my PhD was how do you measure what limited is? How, what's the measurement factor? But it usually has a limited amount of actors involved in the war. And, but the difficulty is if you take into account the Vietnam War. So the Vietnam War was a limited war fought in a limited way between the US and the South Vietnamese forces and its allies. But on the part of the North Vietnamese, it was fought as a total war. The only thing that the North Vietnamese were happy with was total and unconditional surrender, which they got. So what is the most likely war? A limited war exhaustion strategy. This is the most likely type, most likely type of war. And we'll finish on this note, uh, more or less. And so this is long, but this is what a limited war of exhaustion is. Mobility, manoeuvre, peripheral attacks on the enemy, cutting off ports, sinking ships in ports so no more ships can get in. Um, what you do is you attack the enemy's trade. It's an island nation, easy to do. Park a few submarines in the Taiwan Strait. The Americans can't get their battle uh, fleets down there because it's too thin, it's too, it's not, it's too narrow. Um, conduct raids on the enemy's ports shoot a few of their coastal towns up, and then stay away and see what happens. In a liberal democracy, you're going to get voters going, this is not good enough. We need to vote in a government that stops this. That's a problem with a liberal democracy. Okay, you sometimes um, also fight alongside larger forces on the island. Some people will betray the government, so you utilise them. And finally, you outmaneuver the enemy into an untenable position in which peace agreement set by the British, peace agreement set by China. So this is the type of war that I think will take place. Whether it escalates or not into something more than a limited regional war or an inter-regional war or a um, 
total war is I don't know crystal ball. This is the most likely type of war that will take place, and the reason that it will take place is because if there's too many body bags come back to China, that will impact on the Chinese government. That will impact on the Chinese Communist Party. So, some common question, who will come to Taiwan's aid? Will Australia be involved? Must it become involved? Will the USA come to Australia's aid if Australia gets heavily involved? Other actors and blocks, will these people become involved? Will Australia's capabilities, JSFs, attack class submarines, we don't have any expeditionary forces, we don't have a lot of naval surface assets, we don't have a lot of logic and support assets, we're an island nation just like Taiwan. If we get involved, what do I think will happen? Um, what I think will happen is that, um, what I think will happen is if Australia gets involved, China will sink Australian assets to find out what the US will do. And it's also important to understand that war isn't something that is a single entity on its own. There's a lot of stratification associated with the war. So what would I be doing now if I was sitting in China and I was a strategist? OK, so I'm, I'm moved on Taiwan. Australia wants to get involved. But I don't want America to get involved. So I'm sitting in the Chinese Communist Party. What's the first thing that I would say? We won't take out Pine Gap. What about if we have an agreement that we don't, I don't take out Pine Gap, that China doesn't take out Pine Gap? What are the Americans going to say? Well, that means we don't have to get involved. If we do have these promises, what was the, why did Indonesia invade Timor Leste? Because Gulf Woodland agreed that Australia wouldn't get involved. And President Ford said that the Americans wouldn't get involved. This was behind the scenes diplomatic conversations. They made a deal about another country. And of course that went to, uh, that deconstructed over time because of the rebel movements, the then rebel movements in Timor Leste. But the, the fact of the matter is that what about if China can, cuts a deal with America that they won't get involved? Where does that leave Australia? Australia is convinced that Australia is convinced that it's a middle, it's a middle power in the uh, in the Asia Pacific. It's a middle power in the Asia Pacific, and it's keen to keep that preponderant role. So, will it go to to Taiwan's aid? I think that Australia will. I think it'll be pushed by America to go to Taiwan's aid if a war breaks out. And I think that China, if a war breaks out, the first thing you have to go after is the middle power. And Australia doesn't have the... Australia has the assets, but it can't replace the assets once they've been destroyed. And these attack class submarines will be nowhere to be seen still. So if, if China moves on Taiwan by 2035 or thereabouts, these won't be available to us even in 2035, or they'll be in their infancy. So we don't have expeditionary forces. We don't have forces like the United States Marines. We don't have replacements for these. We, if we get 72 JSFs, 10% of them at any one time will be unserviceable, unable to fly, and you lose 10% of accidents. So you're now down to 52. But the next year, you've got the same problem. You'll lose 10% of accidents, 10% be the service war. So now you're down to 32. So if the war goes for three years, we'll be down to 10 aeroplanes. So, because they can't be replaced. Who is going to replace them? How are we going to get the crews, the air crews, etc.? How are we going to get the crews fleet when they're not even, they don't even exist? They won't even be in the water for more than a couple of years. And China, meanwhile, is building up its capabilities and it is going to take Taiwan one way or the other. So, that's the scenario that Australia faces, per se. And if the war escalates, Australia will become involved. Japan, will Japan become involved? Well, if the Americans are still in Okinawa, possibly. But if the Americans are pulled out of Okinawa, will Japan become involved? I doubt it. I doubt it. But Australia wants to keep its middle power status. And we've got big problems if... Uh, part of the reason that that is, of course, is because our... Um, our politicians simply don't understand this scenario per se. But I think a war is coming personally. 
and I'll end on that very stable note. Thank you. Thank you, Stroke. Questions? Um, since World War II, the world has not seen major power conflict. We've basically had proxy wars. Mm. It yeah. sounds frighteningly as if you're saying that either this could escalate into a major power war involving numerous forces, or it might remain limited to a proxy war where Australia is one of the proxy combatants. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, but uh, you just which which scenario do you see is you say you believe a war is coming? Do you think there's a danger that we will see major power war once more? There is a danger that any war. Any war has a danger associated with it from going to lim from limited to total. So that's, excuse me, that's a given. Um, the issue for Australia and for America is that th this word here, nascent. How long does that last? 1995, 2005, 2015. So maybe it's about 25 years that the term nascent applies. Mm. So what happens is, at the beginning, things move incrementally. And then what happens, after about 25 or 30 years, they then move exponentially. So China will begin to stamp its authority more and more on its region, what it believes is its region. Mm -hmm. And part of this, there's a couple of things, a few things that need mentioning. Xi Jinping is the son of a uh, Maoist war hero. So he's got big shoes to fill culturally. And there's three other aspects. In 2011, um, Chinese anti-ship missile technology superseded America. So that's so those aircraft carriers look good, but they're no longer relevant in war. So they've got an overt presence, but they're no longer the weapons they once were. So, and if you put a battle fleet into the Taiwan Strait, it's confined. You've got one aircraft carrier that's supported by 12 ships. So they're all jammed up together. And you don't want them jammed up together because they become targets. The second thing is that between we would between 2007 and 2013, thereabout, Xi Jinping was what we would call Secretary of State, Minister of State, something like that. He captured and killed every single CIA agent in China. So there was no information coming out of China that the Americans could use. And the third thing is anti-satellite technology. So the Chinese have a vast array of anti-satellite technology now, and this weakens the American presence over China considerably. So if China does move into, if Taiwan remains steadfast in its independence, China will move against it. And there's no evidence that Taiwan won't do that. And collectively, there's been no evidence in my studies that an industrial revolution doesn't trigger a war. It doesn't necessarily trigger a total war, but it triggers a war. So I think it will remain regional, personally. But that depends on how many actors become involved. What if the EU becomes involved? By then, the EU will have its own army and navy. So that might be a, that might be a, a, sh a game shifter for, for the situation. Europe going to war with China would not be a pretty sight. But by then, you know, that could be a game changer. That could be something that either de escalates the situation or escalates it. So, but it, there will definitely be a regional war, that's what I think. Hi, thank you, Strokes. That was really interesting. And thank you for the overview about the industrial relations stuff, because I, you know, I don't know about that stuff, so it was really useful for someone like me. I was wondering, um, can you talk a little bit more about your fellowship in Taiwan? Like what, what you were there, what they, what the China, it was the Taiwanese government. Yeah. Got you, yeah. What they wanted from you, yeah. and whether you saw any kind of, I don't know, evidence or not. Um, evidence probably not quite the word I'm looking for, but like day to day impact of this stuff going on in your everyday experience while you were yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, yes. 
it took me a year to write this thing, and I went to numerous conferences. The issue that I found in the day-to-day -day of it is that the Taiwanese government is stuck in the 1950s in terms of war. They're stuck on, everybody knows about the D-Day landings. They think that the Chinese will come over and land on the shores and storm ashore and take the place. But that won't, that's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is because that's the best way to get yourself killed. And that's the best way for the Chinese Communist Party to lose power. So they're not going to do that. Because it's already been computer driven and proven that 120,000 troops will be lost in the crossing before you even get to the shore. So that's what they're relying on. So I spoke to these generals, uh, these old retired generals, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I said, "This is what this. The reason it's not going to happen is because it'll bring down the Chinese Communist government." So, but I couldn't get that message across because they're stuck in in the Second World War domain of, and also uh, in the general community, uh, men and men and women are fighting age between 19 and 39. Uh, about. 56% of them don't believe America will come to Taiwan's aid. So there's already an undercurrent in the, in the community of, that America will not come. And part of that reason is because of the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, these wars that are just endless mm -hmm. and cost lives and impact on the American government. So the American government feels underappreciated, underloved, underutilized, like they just do. And part of that is irresponsible political decision making, but the back lash for Taiwan is, will they actually come to... The, the ex-generals and the retired commanders that I spoke to still believe that America will come to their aid. So, um, that's and not shared by the general public. That's not shared by no. the general public. But I wrote, the, I wrote it as an independent analysis, and uh, I did say all this in the independent analysis, and it wasn't received very well. <laughs> it, I was going to ask. How yeah, it wasn't received yeah. very well. Uh, and the reason it wasn't received very well is because it didn't fit the model. I gave them 10 reasons of why China won't invade like they think it will. And the, also they have a, a strong defensive capability, but they can't obviously move on mainland China. So they, there's no pincer movements and footholds, and, uh, footholds in other countries, you know, like getting on the beach and pushing out from the beach, like in the D-Day land, which you've all seen Saving Private Ryan, you get on the beach and you push out, you fortify the beach, then you push out from the beach. It's not going to happen. First of all, there's no beaches, there's only cliffs. <laughs> and, but the other side of that coin is that warfare has moved on. It's a dynamic. Warfare is a dynamic. It's not static. And the people, the commanders, don't seem to understand this. Because I said to them, what about if you lose five ships? Where are you going to... It's not about losing the five ships. If you're on one of them, let me tell you, it is about losing your life on a ship. <laughs> but, okay, so you lose five, you've got 15, you lose five. Where are you going to get the replacement? Who's going to sail them in? The Chinese have got a massive submarine fleet. And they've designed submarines to fit in the Taiwan Strait. So they're called mini-subs, they're not the mini-subs, you know, the World War II mini-subs. They're just small, fast, manoeuvrable mini-submarines. They're about half the size of, say, an attack class submarine. The Americans have built their submarines to fight a war against Russia. They're not, they can't come into the Taiwan Strait and they're not manoeuvrable. So, but this message to say that war is a dynamic and warfare has moved on just doesn't configure in their, in their thinking. It's really weird, but that's what I found to be the truth. So, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs didn't care how what I wrote and how I wrote, and they didn't influence me, um, but didn't get really well accepted what I wrote, so um, that's probably the best way I can, I can put it. And my biggest fear is that China will take a total war attitude to Taiwan. Even if Taiwan feels it's fighting a limited war, once war breaks out, China will do what the North Vietnamese did to the South Vietnamese and the Americans and the Australians and all their allies. The North Vietnamese took a total war attitude, only unconditional surrender will do. Well, what happens if a war breaks out and China takes that attitude? They'll turn the place into a car park. Like, they'll take out all the bridges, there's hundreds and hundreds of bridges, and they've got the capability to do it. 
So, but you can't like, tell, because they think that the Americans' cabaret will come over the hill as well, and that's no longer the case either. But, you know. So my experience was both, you know, uh, fascinating but also frightening in that way. So. Mm. I have quite a naive question. <laughs> um, why does China actually care about Taiwan? Is it a philosophical thing, or yeah. like what? You know, why would they? Just, yeah, who cares? Yeah. Like why? Yeah. Because they believe that, that they're, first of all, they believe in the century of humiliation that the West has imposed mm -hmm. upon them. That's the first thing. So it's more a philosophical thing than And the cultural thing. They want back what they believe is theirs. The, 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 I mean, they did get humiliated, there's no doubt about it, but, you know, so have indigenous populations, you know, the Chinese have humiliated the Tibetans, you know, like, so... But it's a cultural thing, it's a cultural saving face thing, and also it, it's the motherland. It's the belief that... Russia believes the Ukraine is part of Russia's motherland. Chechnya is part of Russia's motherland. So China has the same attitude. So it's not like a tactical thing from a war perspective. It's more like a... Oh, well, you can use it as leverage. Yeah, you can use it as, as leverage because you've got the UN on your side mm -hmm. straight away. But it's you can use these issues as leverage. That's, and so then the leverage become militarised, becomes politicised, then militarised. And so then you're able to... The, the issue with brinkmanship is you're able to escalate it and de-escalate it once you're a powerful nation state. The British used to do it, the Americans did it in the post-World War II years, um, the French did it prior to that, prior to the British. So what with brinkmanship, what you're able to do is escalate and de-escalate as you see fit. And if a war is the outcome of that, you're actually capable of fighting one. So, so China has three issues, Macau, Hong Kong, all taken from them by, by a foreign power, mm -hmm. and Taiwan taken from them by a foreign power, a homegrown foreign power, but a foreign power nonetheless, which was then supported by um, other countries, mm -hmm. like Japan for a long time, supported by Japan for a long time, etc. Et so they believe it's part of the motherland and it's inculcated in their, in their cultural history, and they want it back. And that's an unmovable object. We're almost the time, but uh, one, yeah. one quick question. India has refused to sign the trade pact. Yes. If China was silly enough to go ahead and invade Taiwan, would not the rest of the world say, the hell with you, we're not going to have your products? Mm. Well. There's always an economic backlash. Uh, there is an economic backlash, but my argument is by 2035, China won't care about that. Mm -hmm. So it's another 15 years away and you've got this developmental thing going on. And so what actually happens is that, as you see, America doesn't care about... America doesn't care about uh, where it gets its products from. It gets its products from the cheapest place possible. But it actually has the facilities, not on its own home soil. But if China stopped selling to America tomorrow, they would get it from Europe. Because they're a highly industrialised, highly mechanised, highly militarised society. So they would be able to get there. So China, by 2035, it doesn't matter anymore if America stops buying from China. Because they'll be selling to the EU. So by then, the EU will be much, much more stable. And but what happens if the EU decides not to? Buy well, from what, if the EU decides to not buy from China, then China will move into East Asia much more deeply. It'll move into Southeast Asia, it'll move into the Philippines. It will, it will have the capacity to, first of all, support its, its own energy and uh, it'll be able to support its own energy and food resources. So, what happens then becomes a peripheral issue, not a core issue, which can bring the country down. At the moment, China is dependent largely on Russia for its, for its fuel resources, essentially. Other countries as well, but essentially, it's dependent on Russia. So its biggest issue is to not annoy Russia too much. They, all, they, have, they have intimacies, but they don't have any expansive, big expansive problems. So, by 2035, China will be a completely different nation than it is now. It's following the American model of food resources, food supply, 
energy resources, energy supply. It will have developed that, and this is why it won't move on Taiwan in the next 10 years. I don't believe I haven't got a crystal ball. But what, what you're trying to do as a powerful nation, a parks nation, a powerful nation, is what you're trying to do is move these core problems to becoming peripheral ones. So China, for instance, is part of the BRICS. Um, and Britain, Russia, India, India China, South, South America. So the South Americas. South so America. it's part of the BRICS. So it'll get its, its resources from the South Americas, which will do two things. It'll do, it, it will um, be able to get its resources from South Americas and it'll piss America off. Mm -hmm. So that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You want these things to become peripheral, not core problems. That's, that's the situation and that's what China's moving towards. That's what the EU is also moving towards. So in 10 years time, the understanding from the EU's perspective is China, the EU, America. At the moment, it's America, China, the EU. So they want to shift it around. This is why the EU is persistent with not letting Britain upset the EU. It's, it's political aggrandizement. But the EU's got a 10 year plan. So is China. So is America. I mean, I think the, the plan for America is isolationism and not wanting mm -hmm. to push too hard into these regions anymore because the world's, they're fed up with the rest of the world. And that's okay, but that's what I believe is happening. So, okay. Thank you, Stroke. Please join me in thanking Stroke.